Philip here, uh, who will present Don Redford's paper on uh, the subject of traditions regarding a great going forth from Northeast Africa, date and reliability. Hello. Okay, first of all, uh, Don has asked me to apologize because he cannot be here himself. He's digging at Mendes, and as a director of a dig, he cannot escape the dig. I will be joining him in uh, three or four days' time, which means that any question you have... Is that better? Any question you have, you can tell me what they are, and I'll be very happy to uh, bring them with me in four days' time. This being said, he has also asked me for uh, time concern uh, to split his paper in two parts. The first part he wants me to read. The second part, if we have time, we can go through it. But that's your decision according to the time scale. This being said, I'm just going to read this paper then. Starts, first of all, I must register disagreement with the title of this symposium. The Beni Israel, if that is what is meant by Israel, experienced no great exodus from Egypt. The inhabitants of Israel, Judah, in the Iron Age <coughs> could no more claim that their fathers had participated, participated in an expulsion from Northeast Africa than a present-day immigrant to the US from, say, Southeast Asia could claim that his forefathers had taken part in the War of Independence. That there was a great exodus from Egypt by somebody is the demonstrable fact. But the question is, by whom? Second of all, while detailed accounts when existed in Phoenician and Greek sources, and in the Akkadian and Manithonian sources, the only connected account today survived in the Joseph Moses account, Genesis 37, Exodus 15. This stands thematically isolated in its present context. True, anticipatory statements, projections, editorial bridges, and foreshadowing tropes point ahead and or backwards, providing links of a kind, but these are often weak or contrived and do not undermine the independence and primacy of Genesis 37, Exodus 15. Genesis 136 anticipates in a disjointed fashion the descent, sojourn, exodus tradition, but the latter in no way is dependent upon or incomplete without these early patri patriarchal narratives. The compiler has fastened upon the personal names of early heroic figures of Amoric descent, memories of womb were common from Beersheba to the Negev, Abraham, or in central Palestine and Transjordan, Jacob, Joseph, and met the heroes of a series of etiologies and narrative scripts. There are extant in Middle Eastern traditions, both at the paraphrased and or oral registers, as well as writings in extenso, several traditions regarding a coming out of Egypt. These include, one, the Egyptian king list, Manithonian account, Two, the Bokoris leper tradition. Three, the Phoenician reminiscence. Fourth, the Assize in the Hebrew prophets. And five, the stories in Genesis 37 to Exodus 15. Issues regarding the first four have been addressed by the author elsewhere. But the last is far the lengthiest and best preserved. While the Joseph story shows a style, idiolect, and plot integrity second to known in the Hebrew Bible, the Exodus narrative is hopelessly inferior. P has done a poor job in integrating his sources, whether oral or written, none of which, in any case, predates the 7th century by much. So he starts in, uh, with Pharaoh's army. The force with which the king of Egypt pursued the Israelites is described in Exodus 14, 7, 9, and 28. The hierarchical structure and component core are given only a very brief description. 
but this is sufficient to show that the writer knows nothing of the makeup of a true Egyptian expeditionary force. He describes a host, even using a term, Chayil, common in the Levant, derived from a root signifying strength. The Egyptian terms derived from roots meaning to march, to shoot, to skirmish. He mentions chariotry, rekev, with a complement of three, shalashim, an Asiatic, not an Egyptian practice, and cavalry, parashim, again foreign to Egyptian military organization. And there is no mention of the most accomplished arm of any Egyptian expeditionary force, namely the archers. What in fact the compiler is describing is an Asiatic army of the 6th to 4th century BC, and, is, and he fails to see any discrepancy. Crazy geography and two transit corridors. That the exodus from Egypt is portrayed against a backdrop of faulty geography is well known. Yet through the mixed up toponyms, one can detect the awareness of two great routes leading from the Delta eastward. In Exodus 1237, we are told, and the Beni Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. Exodus 111 in the empty mansion, Pithom and Ramses in that order. And the current passage proceeds on the assumption that this is the chronological order, i.e. Ramses being the last city they built while they are location at the moment of the Exodus. The Septuagint Aurora adds on that is the city of the sun to the list. Thus, this section of the itinerary would follow the line of the Eastern Canal, begun by Neko II and completed by Darius I, and ending in the area of the Better Lakes. The cluster of toponyms surrounding the Exodus account would therefore make sense in combining Heliopolis with Pithom, Sukkoth, Etham, and fictitious Ramses, all to be located in the transit corridor through the Wadi Tumulat. If, on the other hand, Ramses is to be equated with P. Ramses of New Kingdom fame, the routing is inexplicable, for it would take the Israelites southwest from Tel El Daba to the end of the Wadi Tumulat, then abruptly past Sukkos to the, vicin to the vicinity of modern Ismailia. How this vast host would have crossed several Nile branches at in ancient time uh, would have to have been another miracle. Exodus 1320 takes up the journey, and they journeyed from Sukkos and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The identity of Etham offers two possibilities. It could be derived from a dialectical variant of Chetam, fortress, keep, dungeon, or from Chut Item, the mansion of a tomb. Unfortunately for the first, Coptic shows that the Ch was rendered She and N had been elided. Chut Item, however, is known as a late designation of Tel El Mashkuta, Pithom, Sukkot, Huts, a loan word in Egyptian is known from the New Kingdom into Greco-Roman times as a term broadly defining the central tumulat, then as a synonym of per item pithom. The implications of the term, namely temporary occupation by transhumans, is borne out by what is known as the Wadi Tumulat in earlier times. Mary Carey called the area the umbilical cord of the foreigners and the entry in the White Chapel for Harpoon East, namely Huhu Hawa, group of tents, camp, reflects a transhuman lifestyle similar to that conveyed by Cheku. The next move in the saga of the Israelite Exodus poses further problem. Exodus 13.17 states, and so when Pharaoh released the people, God did not lead them along the route of the land of the Philistines, although it lay nearby, for God said, lest the people become irresolute when they see war and return to Egypt. This is a curious passage. 
in that frequent military hostilities are not characteristic of the southern Levantine coast in the period when biblical chronology demands the exodus take place. Only from the 7th to 4th century BC did it become a battleground in the maelstrom of Assyrian, Neo-Babylonian, and Persian forces. Regardless of God's motivation, the passage makes no sense since in the event that is precisely where he's leading them. And now God, Exodus 13, 18, let the people along the wilderness route of the Yamsuf in battle array did they all did the Beni Israel from the land of Egypt. This is a strange statement in light of the aforementioned fear that they might lose heart at the sight of battle. Reference to the wilderness route only compounds the problem. This is not to reopen the pointless rehashing of the subject of Suf, but it is to be identified with Egyptian past Sufi of text of the New Kingdom and later, as is often done, our difficulties begin. Sufi is not directly connected with anything compared to Hebrew Midbar. It designates a marshy district identified according to the blinding of truth with the marches of the northern delta. The gargantuan size of the great babe-like ox is conveyed in part by the description. If he were to stand in the island of Amun, Bal Amun, the tip of his tail would rest upon the piperous reeds, Sufi. Texts from the late Egyptian miscellanies make it plain that Sufi lies within the environment of P. Ramses, Tel El Daba, and the onomasticon of Amen M. Ope seems to locate it between Tanis and Sile Tel Ebwa. The small northerly locations calls in mind its association with Shacher, Shihor, the Lake of Horus, also indicated in miscellanies. Now Sihor or Shihor becomes the tectonic shift which dried up the Pelusiac branch and its environment, stretched as far as Tel Kedwa, Migdol, and Tel El Her. Only, the extending, only by extending the reach of Sihor to the west could it possibly be connected to Sufi. Another body of water is mentioned in text within the same time span of interest to us and in northeast delta. This is the recti water in text from the middle, late Middle Kingdom. The following itinerary is recording. Seret, Gisu, Chutwaret, Rechti, Ruret, Cheret, Chutcheret, Watcher, Seret, Desu, the field of the storm. If that indeed is how the toponym is to be restored, is a tract uh, constituting the Peru of LE16, north and northeast of the later city of Tanis, 14 miles downstream from Aware, Avaris Hutwaret. There follow the Gerti water, the later Peru of the Mandesian township, LE15, a tract already known in the second Camosis Stella, at the geographical landmarks of the Ixos hegemony. In association with both Mendes and Tanis, 20 miles apart, can only point to an identification of the great Dacalier plain between the two cities. The plain, until the time of Napoleon, was flooded 10 months of the year, creating a shallow lake which stretched from Tel El Ruba, Mendes, northeastward to a point towards of Tanis and close to the shore of Lac Manzale. This would be in part a shared common space with the putative location of Sufi. To this point, the itinerary makes no sen nonsense. If Ramses is equated with the historic P. Ramses, then the Israelites have journeyed southwards toward the western end of, uh, sorry, the western end of Wadi Tumulat, then making a volte face then move eastward towards Sukkot to the wilderness. Again comes a left wheel and the mob of fugitives makes to the coastal marches of Seret Desu. They are back where they come from. 
In Exodus 14.2, Yahweh issues new order. Say to the Israelites that they should turn back and come before Piharot, between Megdol and the sea, before Baal Safon, up against it you shall camp on the sea. This passage suggests a little more familiarity with the Terran than the passages passed in the review above. The first Egyptian landmarks emerging into the vision of people coming from the east across Sinai would be the mouth of the Pelusic branch and the eastern team of Shehor, 10 kilometers due south. Beyond this line to the west settlements predominated which dis displayed Egyptian material culture and an Egyptian mindset to the east lay Canaan. The, la the line of demarcation and interaction was the line of the Pelusiac River and its two banks. The lower reach of the river and the broad plains it watered were dotted with vineyards, and in some of the lagoons, Canaanites worked, leaving evidence of their presence in name of way station. Pelusium was an entry point for goods coming from the east. Migdol, here a toponym rather than simply the generic blockhouse, has possibly plausibly been identified with one of the largest sites in the area, namely Tel Kedwa. This occupies low-lying lands, scarcely a, a meter above sea level, on the northern shore of the Shihor, facing Tel El Air, two miles to the south. Tel Kedwa is brilliantly sited to offer a huge advance guard post along the route leading from Lac Bardawil down to the east bank of the Pelusiac branch toward Hebwa, Sile, and Defene Tapenes. It is in fact the first major fortification a westward bound traveler would encounter. Uh, the occupation shows two phases, an earlier, an earlier fort centering on medium-sized settlement dates no earlier than the mid-7th century BC. This was burned down to the ground in a spectacular conflagration which left six stria of ash. It was almost immediately rebuilt on a grander scale. The new fort was surrounded by walls circa 40 meters thick, 70 meters at the towers, and more heavily fortified on the east side. All domestic occupation was now enclosed within the walls, and any houses outside were raised. Finally, a moat 10 meter wide was dug around the fort, drawing its water, it seems, from the adjacent Shehor. The date of this rebuilding is in doubt, but it's tempting to associate it and the fire with one of the threats Egypt faced in the site period around the close of the sixth dynasty to judge by the ceramic evidence. The fort was abandoned, its function to be assumed by a newly founded Tel el which probably retained the name. P. Harriot, in the present context, is specifically located northeast of Migdol towards Mons Cassius. The meaning and etymology of the words pose problem. The P. mouse of, uh, or Egyptian pear house of is the for, uh, an either form of phenomenal plural from the root hur, lordly, free, or to carve out B low lying, sorry. Most probably the Hebrew is to be identified with Sper Chacheti, the house of the widow of the Wadi El Arish Naos, and compared with Chenet Taheret, the demographic of the uh, uh, demotic geographical papyrus, the lagoon of the widow. It remains a distinct possibility, however, that the original toponym referred to the declining land waterlogged as one approach from the west, the Baratra Badlands. The references discussed above, in light of inclusion of Mons Cassius, Bel Saphon, admit of only one localization. The event of the delivery at the sea is to be localized northeast of Tel Kedwa along the coast bordering Lake Bardawil, where the Barathra are to be found. 
These devourers quicksand wrought havoc among large bodies of troops in the period of the late Scythe and Persian period. Just as in the case of Pharaoh's forces, the earth swallowed them, Exodus 15:11. The sea in all of this is, of course, the Mediterranean, on the shore of which, Exodus 14:30, the enemy dead are washed up. Into this mix was confusedly introduced the motif of waters pushed back, a theme found in folklore from the 17th century BC through Roman times, but non consonant with either location or the course of events in the biblical story. I'm finished. Uh, from the end of the New Kingdom to the northeast frontier of the Delta, had never for centuries experienced the high tension associated with expected invasion, but from the mid 7th century BC, it became an active war zone. Three Assyrian invasions, two attempted Babylonian incursions, the over overwhelming Persian incursion, and the numerous Persian attempts, attempts to regain an entry culminating in Artaxerxes III's successful conquest of 343. All these contributed to the shaping of a mindset discernible in the storyline and scripts which appear in the folklore of time. Invasion from the North deliverance from the South becomes a principal theme which informs a large body of tales disseminated undoubtedly at an oral register but enjoying written form increasingly in the egypto foreign and geo pagan polemic. From the end of the New Kingdom to the no, uh, that's it. Yeah. Sorry, from the end of the New Kingdom to the northeast frontier of the Delta, never for centuries experienced the high tension associated with expected invasion. But from the mid seventh century BC, it became an active war zone. Three Assyrian invasion. Uh, okay, and numerous Persian attempts to regain an entry. I think it's duplication. Sorry. So his conclusion was uh, regarding the geography of the tradition reflected in Exodus 1.15, the compiler shows a familiarity, albeit a vague one, with only two areas, the east-west transit corridor through LE8, Harpoon East, to the land between Shehor, Pelusium, and Lake Bardawil. The former is represented by the sequence Heliopolis, Pitham, Cheku, Sukkot, and Etham, into which Ramses has been inserted, probably because of the number of Ramesside objects visible in the area. This is the line of Eastern Canal begun by Neko II around 600 BC and completed by Darius a century later. Fixation on, his uh, on this transit corridor explained the interest taken in Heliopolis in the fabrication of the Joseph and Exodus tales. The theophoric names of Joseph's master and his father-in-law point to Heliopolis, and his wife's home in that city recall the tales of virtuous and unvirtuous women of that city in the 5th and 4th century BC. The temples and priesthood of the city had thrived under the 26th dynasty, and Greek intellectuals had been attracted to study there. A priest and a masses in particular undertook expensive construction work at the site. But at some period, the city had suffered from the occupation of Greeks and Asiatics, presumably mercenaries, who had interrupted the cult and diverted offerings. By the early 4th century BC, an inventory of the site was in order due to dilapidation, but the Ptolemaic period witnessed partial abandonment. Interestingly, a second case of canalization in the Delta may have contributed to a tradition relating Egypt to Judea. Like the Eastern Canal, the Boutique Canal reflects concern of the Eastern frontier, but from the vantage point of the Western Delta, namely size and its environments, only when the political and economic center of the states were in the Western Delta, necessitating easy and direct access to the embattled Eastern frontier, would there have been the need for such a waterway, a terminus aquo, therefore, of the mid 7th century BC for its construction is inaccessible. Only at this time did the exigencies of war and commerce combine to make such a waterway imperative. The canal ran from Buto, Viaxoris, Sebenitos, Hermopolis, 
Parva to Mandis, meeting this eastern terminus on the north of the city. The strength of the Mandesian branch in the 26th dynasty would have rendered it unnecessary to continue the canal toward the northeast, as it could most easily be joined to the river. The Boutique Canal therefore served the dual purpose of transporting personnel, military and administrative, directly eastward, thus obviating the need to go around the Horn via the apex of the delta, and of facilitating the passage between passage westward to Nocrates of shipping from the Levant, thus avoiding the treacherous, treacherous coast of the delta. Along the route of the Boutique Canal, Mandis and Sebenitos were to achieve a position of paramount power in Egypt from 399 to 343 BC, while the former later was to take on the role of villain in the Petubasti Petu cycle, ref reflecting late period bias, the city has sprung to prominence, honestly, with the newly founded city of Tanis in the 11th century BC, but it remained moot whether men from Mendes were sent to aid Solomon in building the Jerusalem temple. There we are. <laughs> Thank you so much for presenting Dr. Redford's paper. Um, do you want to take questions or you want to uh, note actually questions? Actually, I would like to, uh, to take questions for Don, as I mentioned to him, I see him in uh, four days and for two reasons. Um, I'm not the expert on the subject. I deal with metrology and measurements. I'm fascinated by it. Um, I've got an idea of what it is, but I just don't want to uh, betray Don's thoughts. So I'd rather take uh, questions, and then we'll be very happy to email them back to you. And by the way, he has promised uh, a more comprehensive paper to be published when it is published. Perfect. So that will come in a couple of weeks. Thank so any question you want to ask, either now or later, I can write them down. Good. Okay. I, I think we should do these questions uh, later in person. Um, thank you again. Um, yeah.